friends, welcome to St. John's Online for this, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. I'm Margaret Tandy, Honorary Assistant at St. John the Evangelist Church. Our ministries are supported by your generosity. You can find information about our ministries and ways to support them at the links in the video description. Let us pray the Collect for today. Almighty God, without you we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading from the first book of Samuel. Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gilbeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel said, Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sacrificed, and he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. And a reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, 
or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it grown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, people who know me fairly well couldn't expect me to have an opening like our gospel reading today and not talk about gardening. It would be a shame to waste the opportunity. The reality is that Jesus himself did not miss the opportunity. When he saw or what he saw around him, because the illustrations of his teachings took their form, the subject of his parables. And so we can assume that on the hills of Galilee, he witnessed many farmers at work in their fields, spoke to a good number of them along the routes that he traveled, and probably shared meals with some. Because I spend a goodly amount of time in my gardens at this time of year, I relate quite instinctively to the agricultural images. Now, most farmers are not botanists, although in our day, farmers need a high level of scientific knowledge to get the most out of their land. But generally, they aren't likely thinking about all the intricacies of plant reproduction and growth principles as they sow their seed. They know the basics that they need, like the weather patterns of their area, the soil conditions, and the best types of crops to grow in the circumstances they have. Certainly in Jesus' day, they would not have had the understanding even that farmers today have about how plants get to their potential. Genetic modification would have been a complete mystery, actually not even a glimmer of future possibility. What they knew was that seed put in the ground would sprout, grow, and ripen. Their participation in that process would be minimal. No fancy irrigation systems, no chemical additives, no high-tech pest control. For those farmers, all that happened between seed time and harvest was in the hands of God. And they trusted that, for the most part, it would work out all right. Beyond that, there is the mystery of why some seeds produce huge plants, while others, often larger seeds in the first place, produce only modest plants. The example Jesus uses is the mustard seed. In fact, not the smallest of all seeds and not the largest of all shrubs, but an example of a spectacular plant just by its color. So Jesus talks about the kingdom of God as a state of being where wonderful things happen that are often beyond our comprehension. When seeds are planted, there is the potential for, and usually the reality of a harvest that is beyond whatever we might have expected or tried to produce by our own resources. Gardens are certainly full of those kinds of surprises. When I moved into the rectory at St. Mark's Church, it was November. I could see the bones of the gardens that existed by the shrubs that remained at the end of the growing season. I also noticed that there seemed to be fairly huge gaps. And so I began to envision what I would plant to fill in those holes. In the spring, I began to fill in as I would have a garden full of lush growth and lots of color by the time I finished. Unfortunately, I had been so impatient that I had neglected to wait long enough to see if there was anything already in those spaces. 
What I discovered was that in many spots, there were little rounded shoots beginning to poke through the new plantings. I watched for a couple of weeks and eventually identified those shoots. They were hostas, very large hostas, as it turned out. Hostas that threatened by, to completely envelop my new plants. I hastily widened the gardens and moved any new plants out to make room for the rapidly expanding hostas. In a couple of cases, I had to move things a second time. What a delightful surprise, even if a bit frustrating in the beginning, to discover that there were so many wonderful plants creating exactly the effect that I had envisioned in the first place. And there they were, through no effort of my own. Of course, that meant that my efforts could go wholeheartedly into digging new gardens. In our life of faith, there are often times when seeds are planted or seeds we didn't even know about produce things that are beyond what we could ever have imagined. This was Samuel's experience. He had anointed Saul with a great sense of hope and expectation for the future. But Saul's reign had not turned out to be a good one. It was becoming clear to Samuel that it had to end and that a new king had to be found. But how to go about it? In an era of intense tribalism, it would be almost impossible to cross the line from one family line to another and Saul had no suitable offspring to elevate. But somewhere in Samuel was a seed, a little voice, an urging that sent him to the tribe of the Bethlehemite, Jesse. He couldn't go openly on a search for a new king. He had to be subtle. Again, a seed, called in the story the voice of the Lord, produced a plan that might work. The journey would be ostensibly for the purpose of a religious ritual, a sacrifice. Who would suspect anything political of a religious activity? During the ritual, the seven sons of Jesse were before Samuel. He fully expected that among them he would find the suitable candidate. But again, a seed in him, an almost unconscious understanding of the qualities needed, had him reject each one of those sons. There must be another. But the only other was the youngest, not yet a man, and one who really had no potential for the kind of role Samuel was seeking to fill. Here was a seed that appeared unlikely to produce any worthy fruit, certainly not in the foreseeable future. And yet, this young lad was David, the one who would become the greatest leader of Israel. No one that day could have predicted the outcome of the gathering. No one could have seen the future glory of David's reign. And yet God used that moment, those seeds, to produce something quite wonderful, not without its own particular flaws, foibles, and foul-ups, mind you. Where is it that we might experience the harvest generated by those seeds? Often I see the fruits in people who don't recognize it in themselves. I see it when a hand is reached out in compassionate companionship to one in need. It may be in the words spoken, words that it that often turn out to be exactly what someone needed to hear, but what the person speaking might have felt were mere drivel. In a situation that seemed beyond meaningful expression. In the years that I have been part of this congregation, I have seen this in action. The humble offering of presence, of assistance, perhaps of food. It happens when we allow God to work in and through us, even in the simplest of activities. So don't shy away because you think you don't know what to say 
or do. Just offering yourself is sufficient. I have seen it happen when someone is encouraged to take on a position of leadership or to undertake a specific task. They may resist and need some encouragement, not at all sure they can handle what they're being asked to do. But in the end, they often excel and along the way gain skills they hadn't anticipated. So when you're asked to take on something new or give leadership when you think you don't have the skills, trust that the one asking might have some insight into your potential and take the chance. I have seen the seed flourish in relationships. Sometimes we convince ourselves that certain relationships can't possibly work and we're surprised when years later those suspect pairings get stronger and stronger while the ones we thought were fail-safe flounder. Perhaps those seeds were more carefully tended. The image of seeds in the context of faith is a great one. It's always amazing how such seemingly insignificant things as little seeds can germinate and flourish. But it's no more amazing than the way in which faith can grow from the seeds that we may not even remember being planted. Our job as gardeners or farmers in God's wonderful world is to plant the seeds with words of hope and witness to our own faith, to nurture our own faith through prayer, worship, and the study of God's word, and to encourage the growth of faith in those we encounter in our lives. Then may we all walk with true confidence, with a vibrant faith. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray for God's mercy and compassion as we lift up concerns of the world and the witness of the church. For the peace of the world, remembering especially at this time Ukraine and the Middle East, the Lord grant that we may live together in justice and faith. For this country and especially for King Charles, the Governor General, the Prime Minister, and all in authority, the Lord help them to serve their people according to his holy will. For children and young people, as they grow close to the time when they enjoy their summer vacation, the Lord keep them safe and guide their growth and development. For the sick and all those in need, bringing to mind those who are on our hearts and who have asked for our prayers. The Lord deliver them and keep them in his love. For those who have died in the peace of Christ, and for those whose faith is known to God alone, the Lord grant them a place in the eternal kingdom. For all who are condemned to exile, prison, harsh treatment, or hard labor, for the sake of justice and truth, for refugees driven from their homelands by injustice and violence, the Lord support them and keep them steadfast. We pray for the church, for all who bear witness to the gospel. The Lord direct our lives in the spirit of service and sacrifice. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.